many secrets of the Mao Mao, this oath will kill me. If I am called in the night and refuse to come, this oath will kill me. If I see anyone steal white man's property, I must help him. I must hide what he gives me and say nothing, or this oath will kill me. The whole system in this country, the economic system, is such that uh, jobs are scarce. Automation is limiting jobs. It's, it's, it's decreasing jobs. And uh, if autom as automation eliminates the job opportunities, legislation will not create job opportunities. All it will do is bring about friction and hostility between the two races. You, you see, there will be no uh, progressive revival if black uh, folks are not deeply involved in it. I will obey all orders of the Mao Mao, or this oath will kill me. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Mao Mao Hour with your host, the Pascal Robert. Peace and greetings to the chat. Peace and greetings to the audience. Peace and greetings, Jason Miles. So, as you guys know, unlike last month, uh, we had there was a bit of an error when it went up, and the show was live on the on the regular YouTube channel. This is a patron only segment where the show itself, of course, will go live shortly at six. But if you guys would like to interact with Pascal, and we're adding, I got promised, call-ins. So Pascal is going to give us his take. And after he's done with his take, the number is on the screen, 626-873-8658. You can call in and you can talk with Pascal about what you agree with, disagree with. So on that note, I will let Pascal handle the, the Mau Mau. Greetings, friends, comrades, and enemies. This, as you all know, is Black History Month. And this is the Mau Mau Hour, where we talk about various issues, oftentimes pretending, pertaining to Black politics and Black political history, or uh, just our general overall thoughts on phenomenon that existed in the black social and cultural realm. For this, this Mau Mau Hour was inspired by a variety of things that I have been discussing and posting on social media, but it was particularly inspired by uh, my completion of Adolf Reed's recent book, The South, as well as some reading that I have been doing on the role of white philanthropy in black education in the South. And the correlation that all of these things have together is that they are rooted in basically being placed in a space and time in the 19th century between the Hayes-Tillman Compromise in 1877, when the Republican president of the United States during the election of 1876 was so close in electoral votes that the Republican and Democrat came to an agreement that the Republican, and don't forget at that time, Republicans were the liberal ones. They were the ones who, you know, Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves and so on and so forth. And the Democrats were the conservative or the, the party of white supremacy. In exchange for not contesting the election, that the, the Republicans would remove federal troops from the South and the federal troops at that time uh, during reconstruction are what protected the actual sovereignty in the political and social sovereignty of the freedmen who were newly freed slaves. So that particular phenomenon of ending the presence of the Northern military soldiers started to cause an increase in racial tension in the South, but as Adolph Reed so eloquently stated, that was not the beginning of Jim Crow. And one of the reasons why it was not the beginning of Jim Crow was because large numbers of Blacks still had the franchise of voting, and there was no officially 
nationalized sanction or recognized law of the land of segregation. So even though there had been racial tension and racial hostility, there was no national policy in the South or in the South or elsewhere on segregation. And there was also not a complete removal of the franchise. So black men still had suffrage. Black women, all, all women still were not able to vote. That did not change until the early uh, 1900s. So the question that I, the reason why I want to bring this up is because oftentimes we know people discuss the reconstruction period. We had a whole, there was a recent, I think a PBS show done by uh, Henry Louis Gates Jr. on reconstruction. But there seems to be a lack of understanding. It doesn't seem to be, I know there is, of what exactly are the factors that go from the Hayes-Tilden Compromise of 1877 that bring forth the Plessy versus Ferguson decision in 1896 that kicks in Jim Crow. The question becomes, why exactly did the American South or the American ruling class need an institution like Jim Crow in the first place? And what was Jim Crow? Jim Crow was the legal, de facto, and de jure regime of segregation that denied Black people access to public facilities, public utilities, as well as private facilities and utilities, and disenfranchised their capacity to vote by allowing various types of voting schemes, such as, uh, 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 you know, uh, being literacy tests, uh, uh, fees and things of that nature to infringe upon their franchise to vote and participate. So the question becomes, why exactly, after the Hayes-Tilden Compromise of 1877, does it become necessary for the Supreme Court to commence this regime called Jim Crow that perpetuates and continues starting up until the 1954 Plessy versus Ferguson decision, but really doesn't get dismantled until the legislation of the 1960s, starting with the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the Fair Housing Act of, I believe, 1967 or 68, and all of those other legislations that are required to desegregate public and private accommodations for Black people. So the question becomes, why was it necessary for the Supreme Court in 1896 to implement a de facto, which means in actual fact, and de jure, which means in actual law, system of real white supremacy to disenfranchise Black people so long? Part of the reasons why I want to have this conversation is that, number one, I think, and I mentioned this yesterday on the show, that it is a, tra it is a travesty that the particular politics of this era, particularly between 1886 and 1895, that particular post-Reconstruction, pre-Jim Crow era, is not discussed, not celebrated, is not and is not made aware at all amongst black folk. Second of all, I want to have this conversation because I find it there is a persistent trend amongst not only some of our comrades on the left, but some of our uh, not maybe not comrades, but some of black nationalist types, or even some who consider themselves race first types who find it very, very necessary to make it seem like the possibility of interracial or cross-racial coalitions between Black and white people to challenge Black oppression is an impossibility because, quote, unquote, white people will always betray us, they've always betrayed us, et cetera, et cetera, so on and so forth, or white people are too racist, or we don't have white people that are good enough to do that. And the period of time that I want to concentrate on today is a period called 
the populist era or the populist movement. First of all, not only is the populist era not a period of time that is very effectively discussed in Black history or Black political history, the populist era is a period of time that is almost never covered in American history overall, unless you're taking a more sophisticated, higher level graduate school uh, class. We learn about the Civil War often. We learn about Reconstruction often. But this, this particular period, 1880s to 1890s, the populist era, it seems to escape the consciousness and the imagination of the American body politic, particularly black communities. And I will, I surmise, and I will uh, present to our audience that the reason the populist era escapes the intellectual consciousness of most Americans is because the populist era is the first time in American history maybe since Bacon's Rebellion, where there is a movement amongst segments of American society, which I shall name, that was so potent and powerful, it had the potentiality to overthrow Southern Bourbon capitalism, as well as the traditional two-party system. Now, I didn't become aware of this history until I read an article that I got that was published in an anthology by Adolf Reed called Renewing Black Intellectual History. The article, which I have the JSTOR link here, if anyone here has JSTOR, which is a compendium of academic articles, I'm putting the link in the chat and if we can put it here, you can access this article. The author of this article, God rest her soul, recently passed away. She was a good friend of Adolf Reed's, and she actually was, I believe, one of Torrey's graduate advisors. Her name was Judith Stein. The name of the article is Of Booker T. Washington and Others, The Political Economy of Racism in the United States. And this article, for me, was probably one of the most transformative pieces of political education I read in a scholarly publication, without a doubt. And I actually want to read just the first parts of the first paragraph to understand how bold, and yes, Judith Stein is a white woman and it doesn't make a difference because I think that what she's saying here is so powerful. This is from the first page of uh, her article. The research stimulated by black politics of the 1960s has made Afro-American history more widely known and better documented. Yet some of the findings are contradictory while others are isolated from larger meanings. Crucial areas have been ignored even while the quantity of data has increased. Gaps exist because many writers have concentrated on seeking historical, historical anecdotes for the culture and politics of the 1960s. As a result, examination of Black culture has often been narrowed to non-political, slowly changing facets like family life, religion, music, and folklore, and the study of Black politics has been largely limited to men and movements seeking purely racial goals, the forerunners of the civil rights and nationalist movements of the past decade. That past decade is meaning the 1960s. This article was written in 1975. The root of the problem is that most historians possess the disconnected ideology characteristic of the dominant intellectual traditions of their class and era. Thus, while the social and cultural historians have found that Black community life was rich and vital, the political historians have treated the popular resources of Black political leaders as passive needing either massive exhortation or opportunistic compromise. These contradictions and others coexist because analysis are frequently limited to one oversimplified explanation. 
racism. That's the first paragraph. What is phenomenal about what Dr. Stein was saying in that piece is that one of the biggest obstacles to understanding black political history, particularly 19th century black political history, is that it's always reduced to a battle against racism. And what is particularly fascinating about the statement that Professor Stein makes in that article is that one of the particular consequences of this contemporary political moment, moment with the 1619 Project, critical race theory, Afro-pessimism, and all of these other various iterations of Black thought, the one common thread that they all have is that they try to reduce African-American social, political, and historical reality in this country to simply being a conflict about racism. So what Judas Stein is saying is that when you reduce analysis of Black political life, to simply being a conflict about racism, it diminishes your ability to understand that there are multiple of other factors that negotiate the realities that Black people are challenging. And not only that, one of the most important things that it neglects is that one of the things that Black people have a history of challenging in the United States is capitalism. So what I'm trying to explain is that one of the consequences of this hyper-focusing or framing of Black life in America exclusively as a battle with racism is that it obscures the fact that racism is a form of class oppression in capitalism. In other words, the presence of Black people in America has a particular utility to capitalism in America. Black people were not brought to the shores of North America because white folk did not like dark skin. Black people were brought to the shores of North America because white people wanted to extract profit revenue from free black labor. When you realize that you understand that there has always been a direct correlation between the presence of black people in the Western hemisphere, North or South America, post-transatlantic slave trade, and the functioning of political economy or various forms of capitalism. And what is particularly interesting about this article by Dr. Uh, Judith Stein is that she talks about how this period, the populist era, and the lack of study thereof becomes obscured because Racism doesn't explain how less than 30 years after slavery, Southern poor white sharecroppers and farmers and some industrialists are coming together with Southern poor black sharecroppers and farmers through the Colored Farmers Alliance, which was the majority black Alliance of over 1.2 million people, and the Southern Alliance, which was a majority white, how these two alliances, which were basically almost like trade union or mutual aid societies, unified to challenge the normal functioning of Southern plantation capitalists because they were trying to extract more abusive and exploitative 
labor relations from all of the agricultural workers in the South because of the way in which not only Southern capital, but Northern industrial capital was starting to actually infiltrate into the South. This is from a piece that I wrote called The Historical Failure of Black Leadership. You can find it in the Huffington Post or even Black Agenda Report. The Colored Farmers Alliance. None in today's Black community talk about the Colored Farmers Alliance, which had over 1 million members functioning as one of the most progressive Black economic and political forces the community developed in this country. Starting in 1886, slightly more than 20 years after slavery, the Colored Farmers Alliance was eventually made up of over 1.2 million farmers and farm workers engaged in extensive cooperative efforts while maintaining a publication, sponsoring many educational initiatives and conventions. As mentioned by history professor Judith Stein in her piece included in the anthology, Renewing Black Intellectual History, entitled of Booker T. Washington and others, the political economy of racism in the United States. The Colored Farmers Alliance through sub-alliances was simultaneously a fraternal organization which helped sick and disabled members and, per, and, and pervade advice and f- on farming, raising families, and other problems of interest to rural people. They also taught the orders principles of political economy. Quickly expanding its activities, the Alabama Colored Farmers Alliance created a marketing exchange in Mobile, united against the contested mills to obtain higher prices for seed, and cooperated with the Southern Alliance made up of whites in other areas affecting farmers. These were former slaves barely a generation removed from shackles. The Colored Farmers Alliance started to work extensively with the Southern Alliance made up of whites and the two organizations confederated in 1890. Furthermore, the two organizations cooperated on many initiatives to protect farmers from economic exploitation by larger Southern institutions. Moreover, the two organizations fused their activity into the populist movement and populist party that rose in the South during the time. The interracial cooperation within such a short period after slavery mobilized black and white farm workers into a powerful force threatening the Southern establishment and the political order for order benefiting elites. Why is it that we don't, no one talks about this history? We talk about the Garvey movement and its hundreds of thousands of members. We talk about the civil rights movement that barely might have had 500,000, not even 100,000 people participate. This was an organization of over 1.2 million Black people started in less than 25, 30 years after slavery that was so dynamic that they had their own educational, farming, uh, publication, family instruction systems, health care advisory systems that was challenging capital in the South working in alliance with white people, and not only were they challenging, cap- challenging, challenging capital in the, capitalism in the South, but literally fused with white Southerners, who I'm sure were racist, to come together and actually create a third-party fusion between the Republican Party and the Populist Party to challenge the political establishment. Why is it that in the face of an institution like this, we are always presented this notion that we can't get white folks and we can't trust those white folks. They'll never be willing to help us, blah, blah, blah. Why is it that interracial coalitions are always made to seem impossible in the face of this history when you have Southern whites who are working with Black people who are both poor and laboring working class to challenge Southern capital? Why is it this this history made it seem like, oh, the whites will always betray us, but we always have black elites that betray black folk, but there's never that sense of distrust laid at them. Why is that? This This is a quote from Adolph Reed's book. This is a very important quote. The perspective compresses historical distinctions between slavery and Jim Crow, ignores the generation of struggle, often biracial or interracial against ruling class power over defining the political and economic character of the post-emancipation South. 
as well as ongoing struggle against against and within the new order as it consolidated. In 1892, the same year Homer Plessy challenged the state's new separate car act, black and white workers in New Orleans conducted a largely successful general strike in the face of the opposition's attempt to incite racial division amongst the strikers. In Waterfront Workers of New Orleans Race, Class, and Politics, 1863 to 1923, Eric Arnson documents a complex history of interracial and biracial solidarity and tensions among the city's strong dock unions, even during the high period of ruling class revanchism and codification of segregation. And New Orleans was hardly unique in that regard. The South by Adolph Reed. I remember I told y'all when we had Adolph in the actual patron section, I said, one of the things that I appreciate about reading Adolph's books is that he gives you references in his books to demonstrate how many people, particularly black academics of today, are dumb as rocks. And one of the types of people that I find that these quotes and these citations and these references illustrate are dumb as rocks. Are those folks who always say things, oh, inter interracial coalitions can't work. You can't trust a white working class. They're so racist. You think that these white working class today are any more racist than white people who were 25, 30 years after slavery? Who, because they realized that capitalism was basically grounding them to powder, that they had to at least work with black folk? Now, do you think it was Shangri-La? You don't think there was racism? You don't think they were, they were people who were betraying each other? Of course they were. People are working for their political interests. This isn't a... a, a, a a, a freaking Candyland movie. This isn't Hollywood. This isn't a summer camp. There's going to be sharp politics involved. Of course you're going to have to test people, your comrades' merit. Of course you're going to have to test your allegiances. But show me where in black politics those allegiances are being tested when we have over 50 years in the 50-year counter-revolution of black elites selling most black poor and working class people down the river. Another quote from Adolf's book on this subject matter. Lost cause ideology and the mythology of solid South were cudgels employed to demand political conformity amongst whites to stifle dissent from ruling class agendas as well as to suppress blacks. In his definitive study of disenfranchisement, the shaping of Southern politics, suffrage, restriction, and the establishment of the one-party South, 1880 to 1910. J. Morgan Cowser quotes North Carolina Governor Charles B. Ayock, who made the point succinctly, writing several years after a violent 1898 Democratic putsch ousted the interracial populist Republican fusion government that had won consecutive statewide elections in the South. The Democratic Party is alone sufficient. We need a united people. We need a combined effort of every North Carolinian. We need the strength which, one com which comes from one believing alike. Segregation was enforced on whites as well as blacks. That quote is telling you that there was a coalition of the populists who and who are white and black Republicans to create a third party fusion party that were literally taking over political positions in North Carolina in the South after Reconstruction was betrayed by Hayes Tilden, threatening the two party du duopoly. Yet none of this history is discussed during Black History Month. The popular, the pop, the, 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 the populist movement, the colored farmers of Lion Lights, the Knights of Labor that had over 60,000 Blacks working in the Lights of Labor. I got a couple of books here on the populist movement and the Lights of Labor. And, it's, I'm, and I'm asking myself, why are we selling ourselves this bill of goods? Oh, y'all can't work for white people. Are they going to be betrayals? Of course. When are they not betrayals in politics? There's not a single time that there has been an advance made in the condition of Black people in this country that did not require cross-racial coalitions. Show me one time. 
not slave, not to emancipate slavery, abolitions, not doing the civil rights movement. And then we have fools who will say, oh, oh this is integrationist. This is, no, this is not about integrationism. This is about the fact that when you realize that up until 1965, over 65% of black people were sharecroppers or domestic workers, and that in 1959, 55% of black people lived below the poverty line. If you if you think Jim Crow was so great that you want to romance it and go back to those good old days, why don't you do that when you know you were too young to even recognize what those days were like? There's no, there's nothing more comical to me when I meet a Generation X or a late baby boomer talking about, oh, he's an integrationist. He's a neo-integrationist. Negro, do you want to go back to Mississippi in 1954? You dumb bastard. Oh, it was integration that messed up black folk. We had our own businesses and hotel. Read E. Franklin Frazier when he talks about the complete net value of every blank, black bank in the United States in 1957 did not even have the total value of one small white bank in New York State. Yeah, we buy into these ridiculous, idiotic, black capitalist fantasies about Jim Crow segregation. Talk about it was integration. Integration wasn't the problem. What, pro what the problem was is that we're integrating into neoliberalism. I'm reading a great book right now by Judith Stein. Again, the pivotal decade. It's about the 1970s. How the United States traded factories for finance in the 70s. It talks about how the actual economic condition of the of the 1970s is the precursor of neoliberalism that we have going on into the 21st century. In 1971 is the first year the United States has a trade deficit going back to 1893. This is the political economy that black people are integrating into. Capitalism was failing by the time that black people ended Jim Crow and came into a system that wasn't even going to provide for white people anymore who were poor and working class. Mass incarceration helps facilitate the rendering of black people disproportionately to the reserve army of labor because after being evicted from being sharecroppers and domestic workers, their labor becomes redundant. Crime ensues, drugs, et cetera, et cetera, family dislocation and mass incarceration becomes a pro proxy for actual under, work, under, underclass labor, if you will, and the birth of underclass ideology starts to start in the 80s. The point of the conversation I'm trying to have with you today is that what most people do not know is that Plessy versus Ferguson and Jim Crow were put forth by the American ruling class and the Supreme Court to neutralize an interracial alliance between blacks and whites that was challenging capitalism and the two-party system. And my question is that if it could be done in the 1880s and 90s, why can't it be done now? And why do we have so many white, not only white folk, but black folk who are so like, no, no, that'll never work. It'll never happen. It worked so well in 1896, we had to get a Supreme Court that was getting telegraphed by Booker T. Washington the year before in 1895 that we don't have a problem with that segregation stuff. You can give us that, that decision in the Atlanta Compromise Suite. Because one of the things that I mentioned in that piece, the historical failure of black politics, is that one thing that people don't know is that one of the responses to this rising progressive interracial co cooperation by the Southern establishment was supporting Booker T. Washington and financing the Tuskegee machine. Washington would provide an ideological thesis to extinguish the populist activities among blacks and neutralize the combined forces of the Colored Farmers Alliance and the Southern Alliance by arguing for political disenfranchisement and acquiescence to the forces of the largest Southern agricultural is interests. These efforts worked to the detriment of members of both alliances, black and white, and basically launched black people into Jim Crow up until the 1960s. Yet his betrayal should be celebrated every Black History Month. So that basically was what I wanted to let you know as to why we had Jim Crow and why it was necessary and why the ruling class set that decision down. 
And when we talk about black politics now, and we hear all these folks talking about, we need to go it alone. 13% of the population in a country that's almost 60% white, go it alone. When has that ever worked in terms of actually transforming ruling class change? Let me know. I wish people would stop racial navel gazing and fart sniffing and thinking they're super black, ultra black, radical, like it's 1972, when most of these Negroes weren't even born in 1972. And on that note, I'm willing to take your calls. Jason, you have any questions? Stay with me. Uh, well, are you uh, are you calm now? I was calm the whole time. <laughs> I can't. Sorry, you got me in the middle of eating a carrot. Something I never do. Um, I can't see the chat for whatever reason. Are there anyone in the chat? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I had to go on my iPad to see if people are talking to you left and right. But for whatever reason... I can't see the chat either. It's like they don't know that whenever we do these calling features, it literally costs money. Oh, we have a call. We have a call. Let's get it through. Hello? Call it. Caller, what is your name and where you're calling from? Can you hear us? Hello. Are they there? Hello. Let's try to push this next one through. Hello. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Is this Hello, Shirley? Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear us? Yes, this is Shirley. How are you? Hey, what's up, Shirley? Yes. Hey, Pascal. What's going on? Did I lose Jason? What happened? It's a weird night tonight. The question stopped. Oh, cooperation. But I'm sure it has a point, but that that's a lot for me to uh, take in right now. Can you repeat that real quick, uh, Shirley? We 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 missed some of that. That was my fault. Oh, I'm sorry. What no, part? I'm sorry. Okay, so I was saying that I'm a bit jumbled because I never heard Jim Crow described as a way to. It was implemented as a way to stop to stop interracial uh, cooperation. Yeah, most people don't know this history. Well, I'm a history buff. And so and I'm aware of the Color Farmers National Alliance, but my, my knowledge is very, very basic. Um but yeah, I just never heard it described that way. So I have to kind of uh refocus, I guess, or rethink some things and go back and read over some things. But um I did want to ask you this question, Pascal. Yes. Um, and I put it in the I put it in the chat. I and I'm the chat. Gonna reword it. So, are you suggest suggesting that the black working class should be more suspicious of black upper and black upper middle classes than they are over white working classes? No, no, no. That's a straw man. I didn't say that. I didn't say that at all. I'm saying trust no, no one. No, I'm asking. Oh, no. I'm, what I'm saying I'm is asking, that cause... what I'm saying is that trust no one unless they demonstrate that they have your political and material interests at heart. And what I'm, my okay. position is that I don't believe that poor and working class black people should have any more trust or sense of allegiance with elite pro-capitalist blacks, that they should have trust or sense of allegiance with working class whites until they demonstrate that they have fidelity to their economic program, plan, and plan and best interests. Okay. Okay. I can see that. I can see there being um there being uh issues with that because it's well I would think it would be difficult for some black people or many black people to 
um, to be as an African American, like it's part of our culture to you know re- look up to people who are successful, who obtain a certain level of success in the society, and then to be like untrusting of them because of their wealth would be a bit much for some people to grasp. It's not just their wealth. It's their wealth and politics. I'm not saying hate rich people for being rich. Oh, I I agree with that. That's not what I'm saying. Do they... Listen, listen, um, Fidel Castro came from a very elite planter-class family. That's a fact. Yes, he did. Well... Wasn't he like the illegitimate child, though? <coughs> he grew up. He was a lawyer before he even uh, started his politics. He did not come from a poor well, class. I was a lawyer. Okay. Uh, uh, che Guevara was a doctor. Also middle class families. Yeah. What, what I'm saying is that if these folk demonstrate the capacity to do what the great Amilcar Cabral calls class suicide, in other words, if they have petite bourgeois or bourgeois class standing, but they're w- willing to uh, neutralize the class interests that exist amongst themselves to ideologically view themselves in line with the proletariat masses of the poor and working class and, and sacrifice for their political agenda, then that's a good thing, whether they be black, white, or otherwise. Yes. But until they're willing to do that, they should be viewed with skepticism. And Shirley, I wanted to read something to you because, you know, some people might find it skeptical that I'm using a quote-unquote white source for this information in Judah's sign because I know how some of my off folks are. This is from a very classic text. I'm sure you've probably heard of this book, Shirley. It's called The Betrayal of the Negro by Rayford W. Logan, who is a who is a premier black historian. He is one of the vanguards of early 20th century black history. This is from chapter five of The Betrayal of the Negro by uh, Rayford W. Logan. The Nadir under McKinley. The populist revolt threatened briefly to halt the triumphant march of the South back to the way of life it had mapped out for the freedom freedmen prior to the federal government's attempt to organize its own program of reconstruction. Distressed white farmers in the South temporarily laid aside their racial animosities and joined black farmers and workers in order to alleviate their common grievances. But the economic program of the populace floundered on the shoal of free silver and the racial solidarity concept was overwhelmed by a new tide of demagoguery. Cleveland, meaning Grover Cleveland, the president's second administration, was so beset with the national and international problems of the Panic of 1893, Free Silver, the Populist Revolt. This thing was so big, it was challenging the politics of a sitting president, Hawaii, Venezuela, and Cuba, that he had little opportunity to stop the steady deterioration of the Negro status. Listen to this part. He probably concluded that the Southern question was definitely settled when Booker T. Washington won national acclaim for his Atlanta Compromise speech in September of 1895. In the following year, the United States Supreme Court consolidated the triumph of the former slave states when it sanctioned the doctrine of separate but equal accommodation. Everything you asked me that you didn't know, Rayford Logan is telling you in that book about how Jim Crow comes about pretty much because of this interracial coalition. Well, I'm no fan of Booker T. Washington. I mean, my family's not, at least on my father's side. We got a long history with him. (laughs) Long history with him on my end. So... Okay, I'm just going to have to rethink some things. Well, I hope you found this information I, valuable, and I, I brought multiple sources so that people can, like, you know, check it out. I believe, yes. 
Well, thank I you. I will check it out. Thank you and very much for calling. It's a good show. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Have a good one. All right. Who else wants to talk to the Pascal Robert? We're ready. We're ready to go. I'm ready to do this. Do you have another call? Nope. I'm surprised Strom isn't calling. We can't see the chat. Why can't we see the chat? I don't know, man. Look, if I knew why these things happen, then they wouldn't happen. Jason, you I mean I'd like to hear your thoughts, Jason. Were you familiar with this history? Um, just from you, uh, just so people know, I, I get yelled at e- equally. So it's not just the show he waits to yell at, you know, while he's getting his mow mowing ready. He mow mows all of us beforehand. Then he's prepared for the show once the friendly fire is. Subside. Well, what did you think about this information, the presentation today? Oh, that was excellent. That was excellent. We're going to give people a few more minutes. And then because we can't see the chat, we're just going to have to shut it down. I have to have another device open just to see the chat, to be honest. Oh, Strom said he's going to call. So we got to give Strom mm-hmm. some time to call. All right. What did you think about the show yesterday? I love the show yesterday. I had a good time. What do you think about the Giannis Varoufakis interview? The Giannis Varoufakis interview was baller status. A lot of people liked it. I I watched it again. I had friends of mine who said they really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. I have a friend of mine who works in finance and economics. He was like, that was pretty impressive. McCallum, Strom McCallum, whatever comes up. Oh, he just jumped on in. Look at that. Do you hear that, Pascal? Yes, sir. Strom McCallum. Strong, what you got for us? What do I have? Um, sorry, I need a show's real loud in the background. Sorry. Um, well, a couple of um, recommended topics. Um, if you are interested in examples of interracial labor cooperation in the South in the 20th century, I would recommend looking up the um, history of the Textile Workers Union in Danville, Virginia, the CIO affiliated one in the 1940s. And um, in addition to that, check out the writings of Peter Kuklanis. It's kind of a general economic history of the South that he kind of fleshes out, but it's well, what that book. Really informative. What's the name of the book again? Um, he has a book out with David L. Carlton called The South, The Nation, and the World that came out in 2003. It's a University of Virginia Press one, and um, it's it's an amazing economic history of this whole – it covers that era. Oh, I don't have that one. There was another book you suggested that I did get, though, about the South. A Atlantis um, book? I'm looking for the actual title. It's called right here. Right here. We're slowly trying to put together uh, a recommended Over. reading list for uh, for patrons. The Southern Key. The Southern Key. Oh, that's that's a Michael Goldfield book. Yeah, I actually got that on your suggestion. Cool. But can you uh can you give, give um, um, post a post? Can you, 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 know, you even email us the title of that book again, please? Let me uh, oh. cut up the volume. I'm uh, kind of low. One second. We won't be able to see it in the chat, but just send it to us via email. Yeah, yeah. I, I, sorry. You know, and, in, <laughs> and even in more modern technical it, difficulties. In more modern history, um, and you didn't touch on this, uh, in the late 70s, there was a group of communists that were in north carolina that they you know sadly a few of them in greensboro up, yeah you know, they ended up getting murdered but that was definitely a cross-racial coalition to try to unionize was it textile work yep I, guess. Um, I think you're talking about the one in 79 where the clan yes. attacked them yes are you talking about that yes 
Yeah, that was in Greensboro. I don't know if that was related to textile mills, but um, I do know the vague history of that. I don't know if that had to do with the textile industry or not. Greensboro is historically, along with Winston-Salem, really a tobacco industry town. Um, I do know that they had some textile mills in the era, but I, I can't claim to be an expert on that topic. I want to say that's why those guys were down there. Um to yeah. to help uh, unionize those those textile mills, and they were just getting massive pushback well, from the clan guys that were inside. Yeah, you know Greensboro actually has a really strong radical tradition that a lot of cities in the South don't. Um, it goes back to the kind of CIO um, uh, civil rights unionism mm-hmm. of the forties. And um, it, it's also kind of a historically really wealthier and industrial um, area. And, um, you know, even even now, um, it's like you, you, you have a stronger radical tradition there. But I, I think, yeah, I, I don't know if it had to do with that or not. I feel like that tradition gets a race and also the history of the South being, you know, as you know, very hard to unionize. Yeah, I I think it does. And people play up these cultural essentialism narratives. And, um, I mean, if you, if you look at it historically, when people have tried to unionize Southern labor, they've actually been successful in some instances. I do think that the racial history is a very powerful cultural hegemonic tool that's been used to stifle the development of radical thought and labor solidarity and stuff. But we've seen glimpses of that barrier, those shackles on human thought being broken. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. I think that can serve as inspiration for people in the future, but it's, yeah, I think that I think that people need to overcome the idea of people being inherently reactionary, mm-hmm. even if they may have a really reactionary history. Mm-hmm. Um, that's that's basically all I got to say about that. No people is doomed to be a bulwark of reaction. Nobody's doomed to be a fascist. And socialism is about the emancipation of all of humankind, and it can only be realized through total international proletarian solidarity and to give up on any one people is to give up on the socialist project. So that's how I see it. Well, uh, I think you knocked it out of the park. If I don't say so myself. (laughs) Here comes! And that is... Well, I got to say, I'm, I'm only hearing about half of what you're saying because something's wrong with my phone with the connection right now, but I'm, I'm flattered by that assessment. And um, as always, just glad to call into the uh, best Marxist podcast out there. So, Well, thank you very much, Strom. Thank you for the flattery, comment. Absolutely. I won't spend the whole treasury on this call, so <laughs> I'm going to talk to you all soon. I appreciate it. <laughs> well it's been it's been about an hour we have to get this ready uh for the non-patrons that won't be able to interact with you on the on the show the jealous ones i take that back they might not you gonna put this up tonight yeah in like five minutes awesome man you excited I, had some, I think I had some strong energy on this one. I, yes, you're very angry. I don't know what's been making you angry. Maybe did you put something in the chair to make you a little uncomfortable? No, the chair is well, fine. The chair is its own character at this point. You understand this, right? I understand it has its own skits. All right. As long as you know this. Well, thank you, guys. Thank you for our guest call screener today, M. Tucson. Usually, the show moderator. M. Toussaint, would you like to say anything before we go? I guess that's a hard no. Or with the camera off, they're doing sign language or possibly miming. Either way, I don't know. But I think what they're trying to say is thank you, everyone. 
and we will see you tomorrow when we do our news roundup. And what are you going to be talking about on the news roundup, Pascal? Uh, Joe Biden's potential Supreme Court justice nominee. And Cuba is going to be talking about more Ukraine stuff. I feel like we've been doing shows every night this week. Yeah. Yeah. Says the guy that doesn't have to do every, shows every night this week. <laughs> yes, it's been very busy. And next Monday is the sports show, Beyond the Red Zone. So, again, if you haven't done it, hit that subscribe button. Definitely hit the bell so you are notified every time we go live. And we are out. If I tell any secrets of the Mao Mao, this oath will kill me. If I am called in the night and refuse to come, this oath will kill me. If I see anyone steal white man's property, I must help him. I must hide what he gives me and say nothing, or this oath will kill me. The whole system in this country, the economic system, is such that uh, jobs are scarce. Automation is limiting jobs. It's, it's, it's decreasing jobs. And uh, if autom- as automation eliminates the job opportunities, legislation will not create job opportunities. All it will do is bring about friction and hostility between the two races. You, you see, there will be no uh, progressive revival if black uh, folks are not deeply involved in it. I will obey all orders of the Mao Mao, or 